This is Cultured Hollywood for Smart People for Thursday, September 26, 2019. I'm Nico, I'm your host, still ailing from a wicked head cold. And I'm here talking movies, television, music, and so much more in a way that smart people can enjoy them. Welcome back. Um, We're a little late to the party this week because we're breaking format. Um, And I didn't have uh, the proper resources to do this week's episode the way I wanted to do it until today. Because we're changing format, motherfuckers. Yeah, we're turning this one-sided monologue into a two-sided conversation. Talking all things comedy, free speech, political correctness, social justice, all of the above will be discussed on today's program because what you're about to hear is an hour and a half long podcast with my buddy Joe, who happens to be uh, the host at my local pub quiz that I frequent every week. Um, Also a former guest of the podcast. He was on Why Is This a Thing? Maybe like a month or two ago. Talking about the movie Seven S's in a row. (laughs) In case (laughs) you're not so good with spelling. Um, Yeah, Joe came on the show today um, because he wanted to address several takes that I had given on various podcasts. Last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, I reviewed Dave Chappelle's new stand-up special, Sticks and Stones, and uh, I reiterated some of those points on why is this a thing last week, and of course, my friends Adam and Nick backed me up on every single one of my point of views. There was not much contention there, and Joe listened to both of those podcasts, and I think had a bone to pick with both me and my co-hosts, had very strong points of view on the special. He had seen the special, I believe, twice. I have only seen it once before listening to this podcast, by the way, I recommend that you go back and watch that special if you're so inclined or else most of the conversation today will mean nothing to you. Um, But he had some very strong opinions. So he sent those opinions to me via text and we started going back and forth and I was like, "Eh, maybe we should be doing this in front of a microphone because uh, Joe and I deeply care about stand up comedy. Um, Joe has actually done stand-up comedy in the past. I think for five to six years, he was on the stand-up circuit in New York City. Uh, and I have watched stand-up comedy since I was a young child. So we both really care about this art form, but we have massive disagreements, quite massive disagreements. There's a lot of stuff that we have common ground on because we're into the same things and we had very similar upbringings. And, uh, I love talking pop culture with this dude, but, uh, you know, his points of view on on uh, the consequences of certain jokes and uh, the appropriateness of certain jokes and whether or not comedy is about punching up, punching down or all of the above. It's uh, it's a point of contention and it's it's certainly generated a lot of conversation online. And I think this conversation between Joe and I is fairly indicative of po- both points of view. Uh, I would... I would say I'm pretty proud of the direction this conversation went in. I'm actually very proud of this podcast because it proves that in a very contentious time in our nation's history, where it doesn't seem like anybody can agree on anything, uh, Joe and I were able to express our disagreements in an articulate way and also a way that was respectful of the other person's point of view, which is really good because I know like five years ago, if I got into the same argument with a friend of mine, I uh, would not have been so cordial. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but it was a really good conversation. And Joe and I, when we were done with it, were like, wow, that actually was pretty good. We both, uh, I think, sounded fairly sane and put together and uh, articulate and smart, which is the great lie of this podcast. But nonetheless, <laughs> so here's the podcast. We do get into a lim- little Emmy stuff at the end of it. Um because I haven't done an Emmy podcast yet. So that was about five to ten minutes at the end of the show. I give my thoughts on the Emmys, which I was fairly underwhelmed by. But the vast majority of this is about Dave Chappelle, Sticks and Stones, the nature of comedy, the nature of free speech, the nature of political correctness. Uh, and it's really cool. We recorded it at a bar, by the way, uh, which I think we might be doing more often. 
It, it was a secluded area of the bar. But what's nice is it gave that vibe of you sitting on a bar stool with your friends just shooting the shit. So there wasn't like a lot of background noise and they, they uh, the, the, the restaurant bar that we were at gave us our own space and they shut off the music in that room. But you'll hear a little clanking in the background every now and again. But I think we're going to do this more often. I like the idea of, of broadcasting from a bar. Um, it's pretty awesome. And that's where, you know, a lot of the great conversations in life come from. So here it is, Joe DeFeo and I talking about Dave Chappelle, Sticks and Stones. Here it is. All right, cultured Joe DeFeo on the podcast. I didn't know it was going to be an official podcast. Okay. <laughs> What's up, buddy? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on Cultured. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're at a bar right now. We're at a, the local watering hole. Very cultured. Yeah. <laughs> I'm drinking with my pinky up right now, in case you can't see. And I'm drinking a Coca-Cola out of a Guinness glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's called, it's just to change it to classy, not mm. cultured, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Hollywood for smart people, this podcast, so I figured why not bring... Another stunad that thinks he's a smart guy <laughs> to talk about stand-up comedy. It's like talking to my dad. <laughs> I love the word stunad. I think we need to bring it back. I agree. Yeah. Stunad and um, my parents had weird names for things that I didn't, <laughs> okay. I didn't know were just for us. Yeah. So I remember my mom used to call dish rags moppines. Okay. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Right. And I grew up thinking it was called a mopping. So I went over to my friend's house and I was like, oops, I spilled some water. Can I have a mopping? And they were like, a what? <laughs> Are you needing to mop? So no, no, you know, mopping. It's, it's a, it's, you, you put it over the end of the, the oven, you know, and they were like, a, what, a oven rack? What are you, what are you asking for? I, and so I finally had to go and get one. It was like being in a foreign country. Right. And yeah. Then, I had a similar experience when I used the word jimumbo in like an essay. Because I thought that was like a synonym for big, but it's really just like a word my mom made up. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, Jimumbo. Because you're like, of course everyone knows this word. <laughs> yeah. Did you go up to the teacher and you were like protesting? I remember fighting it. Yeah. yeah. I remember saying, wait, that's a word. Just like look it up in the dictionary, you dumb broad. <laughs> I had, wow, you were a class act back then. <laughs> I used a lot of like old timey Italian insults. I just spoke as though I was a member of the Rat Pack yeah. to all authority figures in my life. Do you walk into class in like a shark skin suit? Yeah. You know, <laughs> singing witchcraft, just walking in. Yeah, ain't that a kick in the head. <laughs> um, so uh, we want to talk about the Chappelle thing because you had a bone to pick with me and actually my fellow co-host on Why Is This a Thing? Yeah. 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 So you guys were talking about it and... <sighs> oh, boy. Let me, where do I start? I feel a soapbox rant coming up. There is. Hang on. Let me, let me there's ASMR. <laughs> All right. So here's, here's my thing. All right. Uh, from the get go. By the way, did you listen to my solo podcast about the Chappelle thing? I did. Okay. I did. So you have my, I think a full sense of my point of view. I on th this. If I don't cross. Yes. Okay. If yeah. I don't cross him, but I'm, this was the focus, um, from the, why is this a thing beginning? Yeah. So. Uh, from the get-go of that special, I was taken aback uh -huh. because the first thing he talks about is, and this is a spoiler, I guess, if you haven't seen it. Yeah. We'll see the special if you want to. Yeah. Why else would you care about two idiots talking for 50 yeah, minutes exactly. about it without, yeah, okay, go ahead. All, all one person who's going to listen to this. Right. <laughs> uh, no. I do feel like people do do that though. It's like they, they have an opinion on the Chappelle special having not seen it. Yeah. That's definitely a, a thing that's happening. Yeah. And it's one of those, I haven't read the report, but I know what's in it. <laughs> uh so timely yes. yeah uh that's why we're cultured yeah. um so the 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 show he starts off uh talking about anthony bourdain killing himself yes out of nowhere and yeah to me and okay that's a valid thing to talk about it's a cultural experience anthony bourdain was a public figure the audience's reaction to dave chappelle saying let us never forget Anthony Bourdain killed himself and the audience starts to hoot and holler. Yeah. And laugh. From the beginning, this is not going to be an audience that's going to give him pushback. Okay. Well, anytime a comic is filming a stand up special, that's the case though. Right? Yes. Well It's a self selecting it, crowd. It is well, it is and it isn't. I mean, they do pick certain crowds that are better for them. Of course. But they'll usually piece together different nights. Right. But but having said that, I have not heard a suicide joke that I've come right out where it's not even a joke where it's just someone saying this man killed himself. 
and the crowd was like, oh my God, Dave's so funny. That to me was offsetting and it was sort of set the tone for the rest of the, the show where you're going to have an audience that's not going to push back. What do you mean by it wasn't a joke? His, when I come out and I say, let us never forget Anthony Bourdain killed himself. Yes. There's no punchline there. Well, there was though. At the end of the joke. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not the punchline. Saying, if I came out and I said, this random dude killed himself, and the audience laughs after that first line, there was a, there was a laugh line through that entire setup and delivery. So are you saying that the audience, by virtue of the fact it was Dave Chappelle on stage, did not know what the punchline was, they just sort of instinctively laughed because that's what they were instructed to do? I don't know if they were instructed to do it or not, but it's that... They felt an obligation to. Yeah, they felt that obligation, but they all, yeah, and they got in there and they said, okay, Dave Chappelle's going to say something funny, whatever it is, the first thing is going to be funny. Right. Oh, he's singing Prince. Right. That's funny. Oh, Anthony Bourdain killed himself. Oh, but it's... But see, I understood the premise of the joke right away. Yes, as did I. Yeah, I knew exactly where he was going with that. I knew where he was going, but I didn't think it was funny. Well, you don't have to think it's funny. And I, that, I think that's like, what that was the initial point of the podcast I did, is like... I don't want to live in a world where we can't call a stand-up comic not funny. I feel like that's a totally valid criticism. Right. I just think, generally speaking, the discourse around the special has not been that. The discourse around the special, as I understand it, or like the criticism that I've seen most commonly, is, wow, Dave Chappelle is still at the top of his game. He's a great storyteller. He's a great joke constructor. And he's a very insightful social critic. But he's using his powers for evil, not good. Right. That's I think generally that summarizes what the negative reviews have been. And that's what I'm pushing back on, I guess. I, I guess it's in how you read it, because I did some reading f- in preparation for this. Yes. That's, I've, I've read yeah. way too many reviews Me of too. Dave Chappelle special, by the way. I was like, after I read them, I said, did I just sit through that again? Because yeah. it's, it's not good for you. Yeah. I wouldn't read too many online reviews. And then I did not even deign to look at the comments. So, yes. Um, but I did. I did do preparation for this podcast. I yeah. did my homework. Right. And in looking at that, I don't know that I criticize it as something. I don't see the critique as being he's using his powers for evil. What I think it is, is he's in a place now where he's comfortable talking about being famous and being rich and sort of impervious. The first thing that made me think of was Howard Stern. Uh Uh-huh. Who I love, Howard Stern. Yes, and as I, do I. I sat there through his, you know, '90s career, or late '80s, early '90s. I was I listened to tapes as a kid. My friend's older brother would tape it in New York, and we yep. get the tapes a couple days later. Right. We'd spend all weekend listening to him every song, you know, and he he used words that I would not use now. Nor would he use now. now. Nor would, and that's it. Nor would he use now. Right. And, uh, you know, I laughed at those jokes. Um, the one I always think of is the um, the Backstreet Boys parody he did in the 90s. It was the Backside Boys, and it yep. was all gay jokes. And, sure. Well, um, Wendy the R-word, too. Yes. I mean, there were many like characters that he brought on, which yeah. is like, that would never fly. Right. He, I think he changed the name to Wendy the Mentally Challenged uh, Adult yes. now. Yes. And that's what they call her. Gary the R-word is now Gary the Conqueror. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that stuff would just never fly, but you're right, in the 90s, and certainly as a kid, like, that was just hilarious. Right, and and listening to it, it sort of shaped the way that I, it was a fearless, it was seen as a fearless thing, but the weird part was he wasn't, he wasn't marginalizing the people that he was poking fun at. He was making references, like, if you listen to his gay jokes in the 90s, they're really sort of involved in a culture that you kind of have to know about. Right. And yes, they're gay jokes, nonetheless. I, I'm not forgiving that. Are you saying that Stern has an authority to speak about it because of his knowledge? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. I'm saying that if you, if you, if you listen to the jokes, they're not marginalizing people um, who, are, who are essentially a marginalized culture. Be more specific. Culture. So he had a bit with him and Fred where he had his torture chamber... And he played this gay character with a lisp and everything. And he was talking about like these clubs and what goes on in these gay clubs. That if you didn't really know what went on there, 
you would think this is all made up, but it was a lot of stuff was true. Right. So I don't think it's an authority to speak on it, but he's sort of bringing it into the fold. It's sort of what the trans woman said to Dave in that after special. Right. Thank you for normalizing this. So the ability to speak about it in a stand up special is is sort of of a tacit approval or like. Liz, you guys are one of us now. We can poke fun at you just like you can poke fun at us and you vice can, versa. Right, exactly. And you can poke fun as long as it's funny. Right. And it's not punching down on that group of people. Well, this is what I have a problem with. Yes. Okay. Th- th- this is the terminology yeah. that, I pun- that I punch up on. But he, but he, so Howard Stern would continually punch up until he, and that's what makes comedy funny to me, is that you have someone who has little to no power making fun of the people in power. Yeah, this is, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay. Yeah. So he, to me, it's, he's making fun of these people and he's sort of bringing these groups of people. I mean, the whack pack with Howard Stern were these marginalized people. But that they were brought. still mocking them though, right? Were they? I mean, well, go, I back, know. go back and listen to some of the stuff. They were laughing at them, but they weren't overtly mocking them. And and I may be looking at it through sort of very rose-colored glasses. Probably. To, but, or at least somewhat, yeah. Yeah. And it may be tainted by... <laughs> taint. It may be tainted by the <laughs> by the uh, the way that things have changed. Yeah. But when I take a look at the stuff that he's done, he's never overtly mocked these people or put them in a... a put them in a place that they, they wouldn't put themselves in, I guess. Well, I mean, okay, so the argument about the rap, the whack pack, um, and now it feels weird that I'm arguing against you here, um, but just because we're both huge Stern fans. Yeah. Uh, like, they were picking on people that didn't know that they were being picked on in a lot of ways. Like, Beetlejuice did not know that he was the butt of the joke. Beetlejuice legitimately thought he was going to be a star because of the Howard Stern show. Is Beetlejuice a star? Yeah. No, he, he yes, but he wasn't necessarily in on the joke. Okay, but right? he's, but he made money off it. I mean, if you listen to what Howard says to him, Howard never once says to him something overtly nasty. He's talking to him and he says, you know, he'll listen to what Beetlejuice's stories are. Like yeah. the, the time that Beetlejuice got on a bus and just went riding around the bus for 3 days and nobody knew where <laughs> he was and he showed back up with a handful of fish. <laughs> And he just listened to him. And I get what you're saying. I get yeah. it. But I think he never overtly, to their face, or even behind their back, it wasn't him that was mocking them. It was, And if anybody was, it was the people vying for Howard's attention and vying for Howard's, um, uh, I don't want to say love, but his uh, oh, approval. De- well, definitely. Well, yeah, a little love, bit of yeah. love, too. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think that's a, entirely what it is. People were willing to exploit uh their flaws for yeah. the, for a, a punchline on a radio show. Now, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. No. Um like more power to Beetlejuice for being able to as you said attain fame from uh you know, an unorthodox medium, let's say, and achieve fame that he wouldn't normally be able to achieve otherwise if not for the Howard Stern show. Um I disagree with you when you say that they weren't punching down though because I think Obviously, in many ways, they were laughing at these people's mental deficiencies. Um, now, in at the same time, now there's a fine line between yeah. laughing at it and celebrating it. Yes, yeah. It, in many ways, that's the same thing, and that's the beauty of comedy is that you celebrate something while also making fun of it. That's why roasts are so funny. Right. Like roasts are supposed to be a tribute to someone by saying the nastiest things possible right. about them. Right. So that line is blurred a lot. Uh, so people are always punching down, and that's that's where I I bump up against. I just don't – if you play that game to its na- its natural conclusion, you l- run into some messy territory. Like, so what do you mean? Dave Chappelle, for example, mocks white people sure. in this special and talks about the opioid crisis and talks about a homeless woman that offered to suck his dick for five bucks. Um, I don't think anybody had any problem with that bit, Right. No, I don't think anybody did. But you would say that those people are certainly of a position of less power than Dave Chappelle, no? White people? Well, those white people. See, I don't think it's him. See, that to me is not overtly. 
and I'm going to use the phrase, I know you don't like it, but I'm going to use the phrase punching down. Yeah. What he's doing is he's saying, hey, and it, rightly so, hey, uh, when it was crack cocaine in the 80s and 90s, it was a it was a drug epidemic and it was a problem because it was black people. Yes. And they were addicts. Sure. Now it's a drug that's affecting mostly white people. That drug is now a mental illness. It's a sickness that we have to take care of. That, I right. think, is the discredit. I don't think he was making fun of those people. I think what he was alluding to and making fun of anything is the fact that there's that racial divide even in the war on drugs, which was a racist thing to begin with. But you can't imagine, and because these people do exist, white people that are less powerful than Dave Chappelle. Oh, absolutely. Right? Multi-millionaire comedian and uh, comedy icon Dave Chappelle. Absolutely. Right? So, again, I don't think that now Dave Chappelle should be, for example, prohibited from mocking someone at his shows in the audience. Like, you know, doing crowd work and making fun of them because that person is of a position of less power than him. And I don't think he should be either. I, I am not saying he shouldn't make those jokes. But isn't that punching down, though? No. It's not punching down if you do it the right way and you do it in a funny way and a not lazy way. What's the right way? The right way is to be smart about it. I, okay. Is to... It's, it's the jokes... The, the Maybe the biggest offense to me about his special were the jokes were lazy. Oh, you thought so? I really thought so. I thought the jokes... I'll say 95% of the jokes were absolutely lazy. Oh, I disagree entirely. I, I know. That's why we're doing it. That's why we're talking about this. <laughs> no, I thought really some of those punchlines were some of the best of his career. I really thought so. Yeah. I thought, th- okay, let me now uh, state my case, I guess. Okay. Uh, for what I th- saw the special as, because like I agree with you, a lot of the stuff was purposefully inflammatory. Right. I think we can agree on that. Like This special seemed constructed to get this type of reaction. Right. And I think Netflix and Dave Chappelle are very happy about the reaction that they got. Mm-hmm. Right. I see this as Dave Chappelle getting pissed off at whatever you want to call them, social justice warriors, the left, whoever, or just woke people, etc., not understanding the nature of his stand-up act. And he comes in and says, off, after the Anthony Bourdain joke, here's an impression of you guys. Right. And it's, blah, 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 I'm going to dig up something on your past, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ruin your career for it, la, 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 la. For the next hour, he's now doing material with the Dave Chappelle voice that you see as off limits in, I thought, a masterful way. And it didn't necessarily mean that he was advocating for the points of view he was presenting. It was to prove, hey, I'm Dave Chappelle. You say I can't joke about certain things. Let me prove to you, like a guitarist doing a mad guitar solo for five minutes, that I can riff on anything. And so this, to me, was not necessarily preaching to his audience or espousing virtues that he agrees or disagrees with. This is uh, showing off his ability to work within the form. That's how I saw it as. So I didn't necessarily take his transgender joke seriously. You know, right? And and I didn't, I didn't take his, I didn't take his jokes seriously. I don't think it comes from a hateful place. Yeah, you know, I don't think he's joking the way that you know some far right conservative comic comic would joke. Yes, about. he's not Milo Yiannopoulos. Oh, God. <laughs> I was so sad the day I realized I knew how to say his last name. <laughs> it was like one of the worst days of my life. Uh, <laughs> I was having a discussion with someone. I said, oh, yeah, you know, the wannabe provocateur Milo, Milo Yiannopoulos. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> uh, who apparently now is a furry. Is that right? Yeah. And even the furries were like, nope. That seems like the least surprising news I've ever heard in my life. The though. more surprising news to me was the furries were like, we don't, you know, no, we're not really. Too crazy culture. for the yeah, furries. Too crazy. Yeah. Um, I have a cousin that's a furry. Really? Yeah. It's how quite did, fascinating. How did you find out? Uh, Facebook. Facebook. So they, they yeah. do they have like a dual page or just they like- have a page and um, their yeah their profile is of a of their furry character them in costume oh, and their name is whatever the name of the furry is. Wow. Yeah. And they're that's I guess that's good. They're open about it. <laughs> I suppose. Is it so? Do you is this a cousin you see a lot? Where, no. Okay. No. Distant so not cousin. like have 
Thanksgiving dinner and be like, how's... I don't think I've seen this cousin in about 15 years. Got it. Yeah. But it was one of those where it's like, oh, yeah, the kid was always a bit off. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. then one day I realized, oh, well, isn't this interesting? Yeah. So we want you to call him Fluffy Nummy Muffins <laughs> from now on. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, that's cool. That's their thing. Look, whatever you're into, man. Yeah. Whatever you're into. And that's... And see, that's the sort of... So, so what you were talking about is, yes... I think he can do and say whatever he wants. And I think you're right. I think starting off that way by by saying that stuff, I get it. And starting off with a suicide joke, setting the tone, I'm right. here to commit comedy suicide. Yes. Great. That's the commentary, right? That's the commentary, but it's so ham-handed. You think? And it's so... To me, it was. And so... It's so out of left field for him to talk about suicide like that and to talk about wanting to prompt someone to get to go do suicide like, oh, you're the manager of Foot Locker. And the fact that people laughed at that, Mm. I get that it's a it's a fall from grace and that can be funny. But that to me was kind of cruel that people were laughing at it. And. I know, I know. I, I, here's the thing. I draw the line at if it's funny. That That's where I draw the line of engagement. But to me, that wasn't funny. You know, And that's cool that you didn't find it right. funny. And to me, that was, that was more saying like, yeah, the guy fucked up. I get it. To me, the comedy would have been not what he's doing now, but if he was so unaware of where he was. Yeah. You know, that to me is more of the comedy. Like you you've studied law, you went to law school, you worked yourself out of the out of the ghetto, and then you are now a manager at a footlocker. If it's funnier to me if he's unaware of the fact that he's a manager at a footlocker. You know? Okay. So okay. So then do you agree with me when I say you are allowed to joke about whatever you well, I I don't yes. think you're ever saying that you're not, you're not allowed. Yes. You're not allowed to. There's no law that's dictating no. what you can and cannot <laughs> say. But just in terms of what's in good taste and what's not in good taste, the line begins and ends at funny. Yeah. You know uh, what I mean? Yes. I, know what you, I, I see what you're saying. Like I, Louis C.K., whatever you want to say about Louis C.K. now, the reason why he was able to use the N-word on stage and use it so liberally is because it was done in a funny way. Right. Right? Right. Like, that was a hilarious bit. And so we're able to forgive that. The reason why Shane Gillis just got fired from SNL is because the podcast that he did just wasn't funny. It wasn't funny. You know what I mean? But you could also tell it was coming from a place where this was something probably ingrained in him even as a kid. You think? And I don't think he saw it as being racist. There's a difference to me between being overtly racist and not realizing you are. Yeah. So, you know, my family for years, instead of saying we're going to get Chinese food, it was we're going to get Oriental food. Yes. And now people hear Oriental and that's like, oh, that's, you can't right. say that. So my, my sister, my, my mother, my father, they didn't realize that saying Oriental was a bad thing. Yes. Uh, and they weren't saying it purposefully. I think he thought it was funny and I don't think he thought it was that big of a deal. It was a shitty joke. It was not a funny joke. I agree with right. you wholeheartedly. Right. Is he inherently racist? Who knows? I don't know. Right. I can't say that. I If he is, he's a not very funny racist. <laughs> uh, well, we can agree on the fact that Shane Gillis is not funny. Yeah. But I think we can agree that a lot of SNL cast members throughout the years have not been funny. funny. Yes. Yeah. And he's, I don't think that's breaking news. He said something. He said something in his non-apology apology. Yeah. That's a whole other aspect, by the way, of these... These sort of things that gets me is the non-apology apology. Right. But we can talk about that later. Maybe. Okay, here's what I feel like, though, when you say non-apology. I feel like all apologies are basically non-apologies. It's just a matter of sugarcoating it, right? It's the way you say you it. You know, nobody actually is sorry. They're saying it because some PR rep said so. Oh, okay, yes. Right? Oh, in that context, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, in, yeah. Mo- I think in most contexts with, like, yes, Which, celebrities saying things on stage. Right. Which, to me, is saying... That they're not inherently bad people, they just don't get it. It's the Kevin Hart problem. Yeah. Kevin, well, Kevin Hart, Hart actually did apologize, though. He did not apologize he did, fully. Though. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. David Chappelle even said he went out, did not apologize, and then spent time apologizing, but they weren't, he wasn't apologizing for saying these homophobic things. Well, didn't he eventually say that he, that he apologized to any gay lesbian people that were offended I think he, by but that's the thing if you're gay and lesbian and are offended by this 
I forget exactly what the wording getting, was. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but I mean, that's not getting the fact that you've offended people. In a, I mean, it's a very violent thing to say, regardless if you have to go out and buy a dollhouse to smash <laughs> over your, your son's head. Right. It's a very violent way to... And if you look at him, there was... I forgot if it was Vice or Vox or one of the V <laughs> things. <laughs> It, one of the V, v to thing. think peace places. Yeah. Get off my lawn. I don't know what they are. Yeah. Um, I think if you look, he did a, a sit down, I think with LeBron James, where they were talking about gay people and he sort of dismissed the plight of gay people. He's like, well, everything's fine now. What's the big deal? Oh, you're talking about the, the shop. Yes. The, yes, the yes, episode, yes. the HBO show, yeah. the shop. Yeah, 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 yeah. And he just sort of dismissed that. Well, they were talking about Lil Nas X who was on the show. Right. Right, and they were like all in like a round table, yeah. and LeBron sort of commended Lil Nas X for his ability to come out uh, as right. gay in like in with his upbringing and being in an urban environment that's normally not very forgiving of that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And yeah, Kevin Hart. I, see, it, with that clip though, I almost understood what he was trying to say. I get it, but that the idea that he doesn't seem to understand that it's a it is a big deal. Yeah, and. Here's the so he was actually trying to appear woke is my point. I yes. think he was trying to say like, oh wait, I don't care. Why would right. anybody else care? That was that I think is what he was trying to say. In that right. Clip. It's like when it's like when white people say I don't see color, right? Which is complete bullshit because number one you do, and number two if you don't, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. Um. So, the here's the reality of of someone who thinks like that. If you think that. Oh, it, what's the big deal? Everybody's fine. Everybody can come out now if they want. Everything is fine. I worked at a HIV AIDS service organization yep. in New York in the early 2000s. And 33% of our new cases of HIV were uh, young to middle-aged black women. Okay. And the reason was their boyfriends, their husbands who were gay... And closeted and could not feel comfortable coming out in an urban community, in their church community, they were not accepted, would go out and have sex with other men. Yes. And Get married. They, and they wouldn't wear condoms. Yeah. Because their thought was, if I'm wearing a condom, I'm admitting I'm gay. And I can't even admit it to myself because then I'll have to ostracize myself from this community that's going to ostracize me anyway for being gay. Right. So they would go out have sex with other men. Some of them were infected and they would go back and infect their wives, their girlfriends unknowingly. Uh huh. So that's the reality of someone saying, well, what's the big deal? Everybody can come out now. The reality of it is it is a big deal because it's an acceptance issue. And when you don't have that acceptance and you don't make people feel comfortable enough to be who they are, it has those kind of implications down the line. And I'm not saying Far be it from me from saying Kevin Hart's causing the AIDS right. epidemic well, in black. Right, you know? right. Yeah, that, that's sort of, yeah, that's exactly what I was about to ask. No. Is, is that Kevin Hart's obligation to get those facts right? Right? It's Kevin Hart's obligation to, I think it's all our obligations and him as a person who has a, a platform to be accepting of people. Even on, the, on a stand-up stage. Yes, like a, st- a stand-up yes. stage is, is where we should be looking for guidance on these sorts of issues. I think they should be looking for guidance uh, for social issues. I really, do. I agree. I think so. I having done stand-up, we talk. Oh, that's about, right, you did do stand-up. We talk about social. So issues. T- talk about your uh, stand-up experience. All coke, tons of orgies. <laughs> it was crazy. Is that right? No, not at all. <laughs> uh, How long did you do it? I was down in New York doing it. We did it for about five years, Uh five or six years. It's, it's miserable. (laughs) It's some of the most miserable. (laughs) Yeah. Right. That's Um, what I hear. Yeah. It was pretty bad, but, uh, we had a set, a regular set at a place called Siberia, which was a show there. No, no. Okay. Shithole bar. It was, uh, across from Port Authority, but it was really well known, yeah. and a lot of movers and shakers in New York went there. They didn't stay for the show, but they went there. Um, it was across from Port Authority. The only sign that let you know that was there was a red light over a black door. And yep. when you walk in, it had that like freezer strip plastic. Oh my god! They use that. Like you're going to a meat locker. Yeah, and they use that <laughs> for the bathrooms too. <laughs> like I'm at a deli. And then. <laughs> 
<laughs> literally, it's literally a meat market. That's so funny. And then over the, the, the bar was just like some plywood with another piece of plywood on top and a toilet hanging over the bat over the bar chained to the ceiling. I don't know why <laughs> the real toilet in the back behind more of that plastic, like freezer thing. Um, did it have a trough? It did. It did have no. It had one toilet per bathroom, and it was so vile. Uh, downstairs, they had a couch that you would never sit on. Of course not. And another bar that was just plywood. Um, so charming. And, and they had a little stage area. Sounds like my type of place. It was, and it, we loved every minute of being there. Of course, uh, that's my, New York right there. My favorite part was the guy who ran the place came up to us and he goes you guys can really help me build this whole idea of a you know siberia being an entertainment venue up and we said really you know because the comedy is good but i really want to do family stuff like beauty and the beast i'd love to do that here I was like, <laughs> the guy was probably six foot five he was a big guy uh long hair nice nicest guy in the world right. but not the kind of guy you want to cross sure so when he's like yeah i can really see beauty and the beast happening on this stage and you look over and the stage is like in a corner, there's a cement wall behind it with spray paint graffiti yeah. of like Bart Simpson saying "Eat my ass" or sure. you know. And they look over and you're like, and he's working on a mm. reboot of Phantom of the Opera yeah, yeah. in space. <laughs> oh, you want to do a stage version of The Lion King? Mm. That'll oh yeah, that'll draw people in. Off, 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 off Broadway. As long as they don't mind the smell. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all we, part of the atmosphere. It was so far off That's Broadway. That's what the jungle was, actually smells like. We were digging, we were digging tunnels to get so far off Broadway. <laughs> um, God, it was, it, but it was so much fun. Um, yes, so I think you look to stand up as someone who, and I hate this phrase, but it's the only phrase I can think of, speaks truth to power, because they are the people who have been in the trenches, who've worked their way up. The problem comes, and this is the Howard Stern thing that I brought up. Once Howard Stern became accepted, mm -hmm. he had no one to fight against. Sure. And then when he went to Sirius, he had nobody to fight against. Sure. So he smartly transformed himself into a very good interviewer, which he always was. Yes. But then he made that the focus of his show. That's a good observation, yeah. So when you have no enemies and no one to fight. Right. What the job doing? of the comic is somewhat over. Right. Right. So Dave Chappelle now is making $20 million per per Netflix special. Uh, he's selling out Broadway venues. Um, he's well known. He has more money than he knows what to do with. He's famous. And he lets you know he's famous. Yes. And it's the same with a lot of these guys who reach that point. And a lot of his stuff was about how hard it is to be a celebrity yes and he he and shane gillis both do, said something that that i hate when people say okay i'm not allowed to say this or i i shouldn't say this but i'm gonna say it yes no literally nobody's stopping you from saying it because guess what netflix paid you 20 million dollars to fucking yes. say what you just said that's definitely true I agree with that. And Shane Gillis said something along the same lines. And then he said, if you look through my history of comedy, mostly bad over the 10 years, well, then why the fuck would Saturday Night Live hire you anyway? And pardon my language, but... Yes. You're allowed, you're allowed to Am fucking I? swear on here. All right, good. <laughs> well, it's called culture. I didn't know if God, it was... fucking show... <laughs> what do you think this is? I'm, I'm holding the microphone with my pinky out. <laughs> At the way I drink, I have my both pinkies out. It's... Yeah. Um, but yes, I think it's that, why would Saturday Night Live hire you if you're not funny? And don't, I hate that self-demeaning crap, like, in that sense. Like, oh, I'm being attacked. No, I'm not a funny comic. See how I'm not meant to be funny. And well, if, I do see the argument, though, that shit you said seven years ago probably doesn't hold up now, though. Mm -hmm. like, I, like, I get uncomfortable enough as someone also with a podcast. I going remember you back, saying that, yeah. Yeah, I go back five years and I listen to myself and I cringe. Oh, I, I used to have an internet radio show and I listened to some of the stuff I said and I, I'm like, ugh. But... It was a lot of John McCain jokes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it wouldn't hold up now. Now no. he's a hero all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think there's a difference between... So you you have left that point seven years ago. Yeah. Kevin Hart said those things, what? It was like longer. Okay. Yeah, it was like 2008, I think. But when you bring it up to him and he's like, what's the big deal? And then 
doesn't apologize or doesn't see why it's a problem, that's where I have the issue. So the defense, it was just a joke, means nothing to you at that point. But is it just a joke? Well, I mean, you would have to, I think, take a good long gander at his soul to know that, wouldn't you? Right. Right? And, and you kind of did in that clip. Did you? I think with the, with the shop clip. You kind of get where he's coming from. I don't know if you're taking a long deep. You're not looking into, what was it, Bush, George W. Bush when he looked into Vladimir Putin's soul? Like, <laughs> you're not doing that. You're, you're, yes, I'm that old. I remember the, I remember the prior bad presidency. Um, Bro, you, you go back and watch some old George H. W. or George W. clips on the, on fucking YouTube. They are remarkably A dumb. riot. A riot. When George W. was like, now watch this drive. When yeah, he's like yeah. talking about like war in Afghanistan or whatever. Yeah. And then he just hits a golf ball. <laughs> yeah. He's like, it's a terrible tragedy. Uh, we're losing a lot of men and women. It's war is a terrible thing. Right. And we're going to get done as soon as we can. Right. Now watch this drive. Yeah. This idea that like Trump was the first funny president, the first president that was fun to make fun of. Oh, no. There's so many. Uh, There's so much material there. Gerald Ford. Oh. Richard Nick. Richard Nixon. Come on. Please. Nixon was a cartoon character. In the 80s, every comic, every comic, even if you were a hacky comic, had a Nixon impression. Of course. Yeah. He spoke uh, like that, like a cartoon character, like a character on The Simpsons. One of my, or on Futurama. Right. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite Nixon stories is that back in the 60s when he was running against Kennedy for the uh, presidency, if you listen to the debates on the radio, everyone they pulled after who listened to the debates and watched it on TV yep. said Nixon won. Right. And everybody who watched it on TV said Kennedy said won. Kennedy won. And it's so telling, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. No, so, it's how FDR got elected in a wheelchair. Like, if yeah. television existed when FDR was running for president, there's no way he would have won. Nope. No way. People were just like, you know what? I, I like a president who enjoys sitting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I like to sit, and that president is just like me. <laughs> so I think I'll vote for him for a third term. Because yeah, I don't want him to run into battle. I want yeah, him to sit down and think about it for a little while. <laughs> right. I like all these neocons. Yeah. FDR will sit there and think. He'll just stay and sit. He's a ponderer. You know, he doesn't even have to pace in order to think. He just has to <laughs> sit. I really respect that. He makes thinking look so effortless. It's and really his incredible. wife is so friendly with so many women. Yeah. <laughs> that. Right. I, you know, it, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, okay, yes, I, I understand your defense. It's just a joke. It's just a joke. But then own that joke and realize that not all jokes age very well. Of course not. So, but of course jokes don't age well. But that's the, that's the problem I have. That's, yeah. that's the issue that I have is that the, the non... And it's not... I, I hate when people say, oh, well, he, you're just telling them to be woke. No, you're not. You're telling them to understand that culturally things change. And if we didn't change, we would be stuck in the 1800s. So... Okay, that was a bit extreme. <laughs> but... That if you don't understand why that joke isn't funny. Yes. And then maybe craft a better joke. Okay. Um, or say, yeah, man, that joke was really terrible. I'm really sorry about that. I get it. I think they find that defense to be self-evident, though. I think I think they find the defense of Ooh, the, the comic? comics. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think it's, in, in my opinion, I find it fairly self-evident, too. Like, of course I expect something from 15 years ago to not sound good today of course same reason why like people will get mad at their racist grandfathers yeah it's i i just don't understand that like i just accept that these people grew up in a different generation sure they uh went through war in many cases like they're veterans of war and were uh you know coerced by their government to think very poorly about like japanese people or german people oh or, absolutely you know so like I understand, man. I get where they're coming from, and I don't need an apology out of them. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I don't need that. And I, maybe that's my larger problem with the cancel culture thing, whatever, you, whatever label you want to put on it. Um, let's use a little more understanding, right? Like, don't, don't you understand implicitly? An apology doesn't mean... Should an apology even mean anything to you? Do you need that? Uh, I get where you're coming from. I don't think someone who's making millions of dollars... Yeah, but why does that disqualify them? Because they're not someone who's gone through war. Okay. They're not someone who's been coerced by the government. Yes. In fact, it's quite the opposite. 
these are people who have now gotten to a position where they're able to be in power to affect certain change. I don't think it's their responsibility to. I don't think it's a responsibility to affect change. I think it's a responsibility to be responsible with the power that they have. Even, okay, artists have a responsibility to do Oh, that? yeah. You think so? I implicitly think so. It's another problem I have, too. Just I, I talked about this, I think, a few months ago on the pod. I was like, why are we looking to comedians and singers and actors and actresses for guidance on social issues? I think that's my... Lar- like, the idea that because someone is good at telling jokes on stage also means that they're good at espousing moral advice... I I I've, I don't make that leap. I'm not saying. Well, I think you're looping in too many people. I'm not saying every single comic is someone to look up to or someone has to have that responsibility. I'm not saying every artist has that responsibility. I'm saying the people who are, I, Dave Chappelle is more of a so, and I've told you this. He's more of a social commentator. To yeah, me, you said this in text. Yeah, right. Than a comedian. He's a guy who knows how to craft a joke. And when he brings up certain issues, to me, he's more of a social commentator than a comedian. That, to me, is like saying John Stewart is more of a newsman than a comic. No, no, no. John Stewart's more of a social, again, social commentator yeah, than... No, but, he, but he's a comic first. The first obligation is to make his audience laugh. The first obligation is not to, to write some sort of prophetic word for, for his fans to follow. But I think if you're doing that, then it's bullshit. If you set out with the goal to write prophetic words, if you set out with the goal to be socially relevant or make a social statement that's going to be like one of those bullshit Facebook memes that goes around quoting you all the time. Right. Then you've you've already lost the game. Well, is that what he's setting out for? I don't think he but is. But that's the thing. He's not. Right. So. so no, but that's that's entirely my point. But that's but we're making I think we're we're making a similar point, but you're not a you're I'm taking a, their responsibility one more step up. Uh-huh. And they have a platform. Sure. Okay. Yes. A comic's job is to make people laugh. If you're not making people laugh, it's absolute shit. Okay. Let me let me put it this way. Okay. Um, just because Dave Chappelle at times has very insightful observations about society does not mean his primary job is to be a philosopher. No. I, similar to the way that just because Jon Stewart occasionally has informative interviews on his show doesn't make him a journalist or a newsman. He's right. not Cronkite. He's closer to Richard Pryor than he is Cronkite. And I think to say, oh, Dave Chappelle occasionally attempts social commentary under the umbrella of stand-up comedy doesn't now make him responsible to dole out, uh, what's the word, informed social commentary? Like, his primary job is still to get the laugh. Yes. However, for me, it's... To me, a good comic is a social commentator. Because you're taking what's ridiculous in society, you're taking what's ridiculous about societal norms, and you're making fun of it. Mm -hmm. That's where the comedy comes from. Comedy... I mean, even someone like... If you go way back to someone, let's talk non-political, Charlie Chaplin. Yes. He was the little tramp. Everything he did was against... The upper class. Yes. You know, the three stooges are hysterical because they beat the shit out of each other. Yeah. But also because, you know, what is the uh, one of their one of their shorts is literally called Hoi Polloi. Yeah. Which is them having a pie fight with a bunch of people in tuxedos. And it's hilarious. (laughs) Sure. Because it's bucking that norm. Yeah. So I'm not saying the three stooges are social commentators, but a responsible and good comic is necessarily a social commentator in certain degrees because they take what's funny or what's ridiculous about society and elevate it to the point of ridiculousness to show you just how ridiculous it is. Yeah. So, no, he has no obligation to be someone that kids look up to, to be someone who's giving you advice about what to do. He does have a responsibility to be wise about what he says. What's the difference? The difference is you're not setting out to give advice. You're not setting out to be prophetic. You're not setting out to sit down and cater to your audience. You're setting down to realize that you're you're as much a part of the social structure that you're making fun of. Uh huh. So your job is to do that in a responsible way. And how do you define responsible again? The way I define responsible is 
first off, you have to make people laugh. Yeah. And second off, you have to do it where you're not implicitly... A t- hey. Dude, a lot of ambulances yeah. rushing through here these days. Um, the town of Unionville is just... <laughs> It's a crime-ridden burg. (laughs) Welcome to Tales of the City. (laughs) Tonight's episode, Death Packs of 45. Dun, dun, dun. Our story starts on an unassuming street. Hang on, let me do the... That's not bad. Yeah? It's pretty good Foley art. Thanks. (laughs) Um, So I think... First off, it's it's responsible to, to make people laugh. Second off, it's responsible to be smart about it. So you're not just coming out and saying, oh, can you believe this F word? Can you believe this C word? Can you believe this? You craft a joke that's that has a good build to it. That's you're not you're putting too much on the audience. If you are inundating them with that social commentary crap, you have to make them get to the point themselves. Okay, that's where responsibility comes in. Yes. Do, it's almost like the, the phrase that Google ignores that they said was their thing is do no harm. Uh-huh. Um, you can be funny, you can break social norms, and you can be um, harmful without being hurtful. What percentage of the Chappelle audience agrees unironically with 100% of what he says on stage? Uh, that I, I, I don't know. What do you figure? Let's guess. Uh, Let's speculate. I'll say 80 to 85%. It's that high? I th- listen, to the, listen to that crowd. It's that high? Listen to that crowd. You think so? Yes. In wow. that in that particular instance? Yeah. yeah, I just don't I really don't agree with you. Really? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I think I was able to suss out the irony. He I really? Yeah. Because when he started talking he's like Alabama was he oh Atlanta, sorry, Georgia. Yeah. has enacted some of the strictest abortion laws in the in the country. Right. A huge swath of people started applauding and hooting and hollering. Uh-huh. Yeah, but the joke ended up being fairly pro-choice, though, by the end of it, right? It was it was ambivalent to me at the end. You thought? I thought it was pro-choice to a degree. Could you see pro-life people being offended by that bit? No. I don't think they were offended by it. You don't think so? No, because he, he cushioned it. Yeah? Yeah. Huh. Um, Even when he said, like, guys, if you don't have a vagina, just stay out of this one? Yeah, because then yeah? he went on to talk about how it's that whole bit about... Um, I forgot. I forgot the bit, but it was. It was. I don't think they would be offended by it because he. There was a way that he turned it back in on itself. Yeah. So I don't know that they. Maybe they. Maybe they'd be a little offended by it. Just like maybe pro-choice people would be a little offended by him saying like, basically saying like women stop fucking around like right or if you kill it then we can abandon it right, right. yeah and and which is a funny line by the way the line is that, that not a funny line I I you know what I I laughed so rarely really and it wasn't just because of the i i just like i said i think the and i believe me i love shock comedy i love bad comedy i love gross out comedy i am a free speech uh, absolutionist i think Uh, as am i so yes um i think you can go on stage and say whatever you want to say yep you have to understand there's consequences for what you say uh, sure. Free speech doesn't mean inconsequential speech. Sure. I think that... I'm not sure that should excuse, though, everyone's reaction to the, the Chappelle special, though. I don't... I don't. I, see, and this is where you and I agree, too. I hate the phrase cancel culture. Yeah. It's... And I'm going to say... I'm going to say something I'm not supposed to say, Nico. <laughs> uh, so brave of you. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Dave Chappelle is a very rich black man. There, I said it. No. Uh, Bill Cosby. Yeah. Complete scumbag. Sure. Broke a lot of barriers in the 60s for black comics and actors. Still a top five comic of all time yes. in my rankings. He's, yeah. he's Mount Rushmore for me. Bill Cosby himself was one of like the transformative specials of my childhood. I saw that and I'm like, oh, stand up. Yeah. Let's let's dig. And Cosby show exact same thing. Right. Yeah. No, I can't. And the stuff holds up. You watch it today. It's just brilliant. Miles Davis. Yeah. Brilliant musician. Sure. Would literally pimp his wife out for drug money. Yes. Terrible human being. Bad guy. Yes. Wonderful music. Yeah. So if you're able to separate the art from the person, uh-huh. to me, that's that's very important. Uh-huh. I think cancel culture, cancel culture lets off the people who offend 
too easily because you're saying now, well, this never existed. Explain. So Bill Cosby, Uh he's a rapist. Yes. Plain and simple. And I don't have to say allegedly because he was convicted. (laughs) He was actually convicted. (laughs) Take that lawyers that we don't have. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Can you imagine if we were sued for libel by the Cosby estate? <laughs> the estate. The greatest. He's not dead yet. <laughs> oh, God. Also, I just view him as dead. Why also, is that? Also, we're, well, his career is. Yeah, I just think also, of him as no longer being here. Yeah, we're suing you for libel. Also, we're suing you for insinuating that Mr. Cosby is dead. <laughs> what a Freudian slip. Um, so I, uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Yeah. I think he's dead. Yeah. Um, I think that. By by saying, oh, well, Bill Cosby's canceled. You are forgetting what he's done in a bad way. You're forgetting the fact that he raped 20-something women. You're saying the punishment isn't severe enough? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that by canceling someone out and like just saying they're not part of this society anymore, you are... First off, you're letting them off easy because uh, they're not. The lesson will not be learned by people who. Oh, so do you think the attack? It's it's easy. Uh, uh, it's easy for, for example, Louis C.K. to view his attackers as illegitimate because they're attacking his art and not him as a person. Right. Okay. Right. I understand. So then, the other part of it is it lets us off real easy. Yeah. Um, to go to one of the things that. Chappelle talked about the Michael Jackson special. Yep. I I believe those kids. Yes, I do too. And it was I saw Leaving Neverland. Did you watch it? Oh my god. It was two of the like two hours I said I should not be watching them. It was four yeah, I think it was oh, four, four hours, hours total. Four yeah. Hours, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. The hardest yeah. watch of the year. It really was. Yeah, no, re- serious. It's one of the most disturbing films of I've ever seen. And I was in tears at the end of both episodes. I yeah. was in tears. Yeah. And uh, to that to that fact, if you cancel culture, if you cancel out Michael Jackson, you are letting yourself off the hook because you, as a person, are not dealing with what what drew you to his work, number one, but also the fact that you're not dealing with the fact that someone really shitty made something really good. Yeah. I think. Uh... Huh. One, it, I heard of, uh, the, the best way I can sum it up is through someone else's words. It was a review for the New York Times. Uh-huh. Someone sat down and said, um, it wasn't so much, we all knew what Michael Jackson was doing. We knew it. Yeah. No, I and it, I can remember I was whatever, whatever the first case was. What was that? 2001, 2003, something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was eight years old. Yeah. Since I was a kid, since I had an understanding of what pe- a pedophile was, I was under the impression that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. Yeah. I did not le- need Leaving Neverland to know that he was. Right. Yes. And so this reviewer said, and I think uh, uh, very, very smartly, it's not what was brought by the accusers or by Michael Jackson to that documentary. It's the the luggage that we brought with it. Okay. I, I grew up, Thriller was in everybody's home. Of course. Thriller was the one thing every kid wanted for Christmas. You know, it was amazing as an album. It was a cultural phenomenon. Yeah. I grew up listening to Michael Jackson. Yeah. And I was born 20 years later. Yeah. Yeah. So we have this notion that we knew what he was doing. And while it was happening, we were turning a blind eye to it. Yeah. So then automatically saying, well, he's canceled out. We're sort of forgiving ourselves for turning that blind eye and not realizing what we were doing and bringing that to the table. Well, uh, when you bought Thriller, though, at, at age 10, you, you didn't know that. No, right? I didn't. But when I, if I realized it, which I did in 2001, mm-hmm. and I mean, I still played his music. Sure. Um, and we all kind of joked about it. We knew what it was going on. You know, same thing with R. Kelly. I made the same argument about this though too is i am i think able to separate art from artist a lot more than most people can and i now view his music as its own entity and i i agree with you you know i agree wholeheartedly my issue is that when we don't come to terms with the issues that we have ourselves and it's easier to just say forget what happened and forget these people yep then deal with the terrible terrible things they did Yes. That's the issue that I have. And that's why cancel culture to me is so stupid. It's lazy. Yeah, it's exactly. It's yeah. it's lazy. It's lazy like, you know, I don't know, like a Dave Chappelle special. It's lazy. 
no, I, and I think that's the, you're absolutely right. It's a lazy way to say, well, we're just over it. We're done. Yeah. Yeah, we're past that. We've moved on without actually having dealt with what we needed to deal right. with. Right. Yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, um, I think I think that's fair. Um, that being said, you don't find the phrase a long gander at the anus to be just a great turn of phrase? <laughs> <laughs> is that not it great was, writing? It is a great turn of phrase. That's yes. great writing. Yes. I'm sorry. Chappelle's still good at this. That That's what... Uh, man, ultimately, that's the hill that I'm going to die on. A long, think, you're going to die on a long game with the <laughs> anus? That's going to be... It's going to be your epitaph. If I was a pedophile, which I'm not, Macaulay Culkin would be the first kid I raped. I mean, look, I just find that to be totally transgressive shock comedy that I don't necessarily have to agree with the premise of, but I can see as a great use of the form. And I look at, he puts the Kendrick Lamar uh, track DNA at at the front, uh, which is, uh, I'd rather die than to listen to you. uh, What is it? Or... uh, you motherfuckers can't tell me nothing. I'd rather die than to listen to you from the song DNA. Right. Um, I think there's a very purposeful thesis statement for the special. You know, like that is the social commentary. And I take it as such. And like the stand up spe- or the, the documentary at the end. I know you found that to be disingenuous. That was another complaint that you had. When yeah. We were testing, I just found that it this. was it was his backup. It was like saying. Right. Just kidding, everybody. And I get it. Yeah. But I see. I think that's legit, man. I see that as like yes, you were just kidding. But yes. then that invalidates that invalidates your your point. That invalidates your thesis. That no, but the kidding is is the commentary though, right? The medium is the message in this case. He used an awful lot of words to get through that medium. Then an yeah, awful, but it, an awful lot of things that were not. No, I, I I disagree with you there. Okay, I think I think the the idea of the medium. To me, the idea of the medium was the message. The way that he executed it was was not not spectacular. Because at the end of the day, Kevin Hart, Dave Chappelle, Louis C.K., they can all go to bed on their millions of dollars in their nice houses with their residual money. Yeah getting job after job i'm not sure money is the is the disqualifier though i'm not disqualifying them i mean louis ck is probably in pretty bad shape right now is he yeah i don't know man you think you think that guy's doing all right these days i think he's doing pretty good yeah no i'm I'm sure he sleeps comfortably and i'm sure like he has a nice house to go home to but i'm not sure like you know having your entire life's work pulled out from under you is like an easy thing to go through no matter how rich you are yeah but i still see him on parks and rec when they show reruns yeah, but so the hell what? His show is still available on streaming. Yes, again, so what? You're still he's making money off that. Yes, again, but do you feel so the money is My, now but, the disqualifier? No, 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 no. My point is, when you have these guys who get up and say, "I can't say this. I'm not allowed to say this. My life has been changed. Uh, my life has been ruined." Yes, you don't. You don't take them at their word on that. I don't because there's no danger of that happening. Kevin Hart didn't get to host the Oscars. Oh no, he was just in Hobbs and Shaw. <sighs> yeah, He's but still see, but that work. to me, it's like I don't know. Dave Chappelle's getting Th- paid. That to me is like the same argument as oh, professional athletes just shut up and play the game. Like you're you're making millions and millions of dollars. Don't worry about the CTE that that you'll be suffering from for the next sixty years. That's funny that you. No, it's <laughs> funny though because now you're saying that athletes shouldn't be social commentators. Like what do you mean? Like so no, I'm saying that's the same thing. No, oh, I'm, no equating, I'm, saying, I'm equating. I'm equating your statement. No, no, no. I'm no, not saying no. That to at me, all. that's what it sounds like. No athlete has said that I know of. Even Kaepernick, yeah, has said, uh, "My my life is ruined because of this." Kaepernick went with it, and he said, "I can't get a job because of it." No, my my only point. Let me be more specific. You're saying that the paycheck that they're taking home should forgive all the suffering that they're dealing with somewhere else. No. That, that's what I'm equating. So no. what you're saying is no, just no. because Louis C.K. is taking home a royalty check doesn't necessarily mean that he's in a good place as an artist and performer right no. now. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. Don't misquote me. <laughs> I'm just saying that's what it sounds like to me. You know what? Because I hear this all the time with athletes. It's like you're making millions of dollars playing a kid's game. Shut up. Nico, I'm monitoring this interview very carefully. <laughs> I can't believe the American public is paying for this. <laughs> Did you have this? Was was? Did you have this kind of interview? With, Are you going to uh, submit this to Congress? I am. <laughs> did you? 
<laughs> you better impeach did you have this interview when, Did you have this kind of interview when John Stewart was on? <laughs> or when Al Franken was on your show? Did you have that kind of interview? <laughs> I'm, I'm monitoring this very close. Al Franken. Terry Gross. I mean, uh, Nico DiGregorio. And I'm monitoring this interview. Yeah. Uh, which, by the way, what? if you've never heard that, uh, Bill O'Reilly freaking out on Terry Gross. It's from like 20 years ago. I don't ago think I ever have heard that. Go back and listen to it. Genius. Okay, I need to check it out. He, she interviews him about his book that got terrible reviews. Yeah. One of the killing books? No, no. This was way before. He was doing self-help books. Oh, and He word. did one for kids. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, so uh, my point is not their paycheck. It doesn't invalidate any suffering. My point is when someone can get on stage and the paycheck is, I'm not saying the paycheck is invalidating it. Has someone get on stage and is, has a platform on TV, has a platform where he's getting paid $20 million to say, I can't say this, but I'm going to say it, or to say Louis C.K.'s life is ruined when they're still working. These are people who are still working. I don't know. He's hanging out at, at the comedy store, but like he's not necessarily working. You know what I mean? I don't know. The guy was making like multi-million dollar miniseries with Edie Falco and Alan Alda. And now he's like, yeah, well, the guy's a shit heel. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm, my only point is that I, I, I don't, I don't like the, it, that to me feels lazy to say like, oh, just take home your royalty check, take your fame, take your fortune, take your fancy house and shut up and get out of here. No, but I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, to me, complaining about being canceled when yeah. you're not actually canceled. Well, Louis C.K., I think, is legitimately canceled. Now, I would say about Louis C.K., though, there is a distinction because it's not about what he said on stage. It's right, about, it's about what he... It's about behavior well, yeah, absolutely. So there is a distinction. Okay. So yes, yes. That's I, I'll agree there. Yeah. I'll agree there. Is that, yes, and Louis C.K., to me, is rightfully not getting work. Personally, I yeah. think that anybody who uses their ability to... In in a powerful position, yep. to masturbate in front of a woman, <laughs> sure. or a man, or whoever, and and hold them hostage essentially, right. um, should not be working with other people. Yeah, if you did that at a Walmart, you were a cashier right. at Walmart, and you did that, you'd never work at a Walmart <laughs> right. again. You never work anywhere yeah. again, <laughs> right? They'd be like, "Oh, you're the guy that jerked off in front of people at Walmart." Sure. Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> we don't have those kind of conveyor belts here. Yeah. Um. So yeah, okay. So maybe okay. So. I, I think you, Louis C.K. is probably having a tough time. Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's my only point. That's so, okay, all I want to say. We'll leave him out. Yeah. But I mean, someone like Kevin Hart, someone like Dave Chappelle, they're still saying, sees on sorry, they're still saying the things they're quote unquote, and I'm doing air quotes to make my, my case. They're still saying the things they're not supposed to say, and they're getting money to do it, and they're having careers, and Dave Chappelle, who is in charge of his own career, rightfully so who can take or leave whatever he wants he doesn't have to do a shitty but good movie like Hobbs and Shaw <laughs> great film love that movie great film um <laughs> love the Ryan Reynolds cameos I do but I also love with a straight face the rock looks at Idris Elba and goes I can't even do it he goes you may believe in machines brother <laughs> but we believe in people <laughs> And Jason Statham can't even like It's all about family, bro. Yeah, yeah. He can't even he can't even muster a grimace. He just looks and he's like, Hmm. Well, what'll I do with my paycheck? Yeah. Uh yeah. It's all about family. Family it's first. Like, family it's... above everything. Wow. Yeah. That's what I learned from the Fast and Furious franchise. I don't know about you. That's what my personal idol, Vin Diesel, has done with his power and his platform. Vin Diesel popping up uh, as a name on... Have you been watching The Righteous Gemstones? I have not, but I need you to should. do it. Yeah, you should. Yeah, I'm a big fan of those Popping guys. up as a name, as a, almost like as a punchline. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so no, I'm not saying that money invalidates it. What I am saying is that these, despite them saying, poor me, poor me, poor me, they're still working. Yeah, but okay, it also feels like you're sort of underselling the power that popular criticism has though like it seems to me like you're almost like oh it's just a bunch of tweets eh, it's just a think piece get over it it's like well, then why are why is the new york times writing a think piece about dave Chappelle if they didn't think that in some way their criticism would matter that because, feels like an easy because way out, when you put it? no it doesn't because that's me that's not but that's not what i'm saying okay i see what you're saying but that's not what i'm saying i'm not trying to give them an easy way out i'm not trying to to be lazy about it but what i'm saying is that it comes across as disingenuous when on your $20 million Netflix nationally, internationally seen special, 
you're complaining about not being able to say what you want to say, yeah. even though you said it on Saturday Night Live, yeah. you said it in Netflix. Same thing again with Kevin Hart. No, that's that's he, true. That's entirely true. You know what? I wanted to um, have sex with Olivia Munn. Yeah, but it's not going to happen. Yeah, Kevin Hart wanted to have have sex with the Oscars. <laughs> he, <laughs> he wanted to host the Oscars. <laughs> that didn't happen either for various reasons. Yeah. I have a hard time feeling sympathy for that. Yeah. So no, look, I'm I'm also with you, and I and you have certainly been around more stand up comics than I have in my life. However, I do know a couple, and uh, I'm sorry. The the one thing that I can say across the board about stand up comics is that they are tremendously insecure people. Oh yeah, right. Like that is that is a universal. That's truth. why that's why comics do it for the most part. Right. It's that instant validation of right. oh you're funny. Right. Um. So. Perhaps that's some of the reason why they have a hard time accepting criticism. Um, yeah. and, and I don't think that they should... Like, look, I do a podcast, and a lot of the podcast involves criticizing things. Like, I do a lot of analysis on movies and TV shows or whatever. Uh, I am very pro-criticism. I think it's totally fine that you can call Dave Chappelle's special not funny or lazy. I think that's all within the boundaries of the game. Uh, I just feel like the... Uh, the critical consensus on these issues is a little misguided. And I think they're approaching the art form of stand-up comedy, which is one that we both deeply care about, as uh, some sort of platform for social change rather than a, I hate this term, safe space to explore dangerous ideas. Sure. No, and, I get it. And, right, and so, you know, from Lenny Bruce to Richard Pryor to George Carlin... I mean, Lenny Bruce was fucking getting arrested yeah. every other night. And he yep. was going back to the clubs, getting arrested on profanity charges. Um, like, this is supposed to be a place where dangerous ideas live and breathe. And where we can laugh about things that we're not supposed to laugh about. And we say things that we're not, I hate, now you hate this term, supposed to say. Right. Um, it just feels like the people criticizing stand-up don't understand stand-up. And that's where my frustration comes from, and that's where I see Dave Chappelle's point in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, like, put it this way. These guys aren't politicians, so to use the rules of political correctness on them right. just doesn't feel appropriate. And they're not. it's not like they're sending people off to war. It's not like they're shifting policy change. Yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. But you have to... The thing, too, to realize is that... Boy. <clears throat> Excuse me, my yeah. goodness. Yeah, you already caught my cold. Yeah, Nico got me sick. It was quick. <laughs> I've been smoking for 45 years. <laughs> Must have been all the air you yeah, wow. breathed in in that shitty nightclub in New York. Jesus. All the smog. <laughs> <laughs> I have that Andy Kaufman disease. Um, I, by the way, I love Andy Kaufman. Of course. Um, so I, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought again. Yeah. Uh, I, yes, I agree, and I think that um, good... Uh, good comedy comes from a true place and it can affect it can affect the way people think I agree with you in that yes they should not be seen as these superheroes on they're stage they're not running for office right but also the problem is so many of the people that we look up to as heroes there's so many people that we look, look up to to guide us are complete shit yes and, well that's our fault not theirs though right but, right? The, but that's why we turn to these people I, I don't turn to those people. I've been told... I was told at a young age not to turn I'm not to saying people. you do. I'm not right. saying anybody. But I'm saying as a whole, that's why we put... When people say, oh, you know, Dave Chappelle is talking about this, that's why people seem to put so much stock. And that's where these critics get it wrong is that they're putting that much stock in someone who is not a shitty person but who might say some terrible things. No, because I think we as a society are conditioned to worship our heroes. Right. When we all right? need someone not we all but as a society we want someone to be that guiding star. Right. Um I feel like, like that's misguided. It is. Right? A misguided star. Sure. Well, no, I just think that that, yeah. that philosophy that way of thinking oh, about the world is misguided, right? It's it's the the life of Brian with Monty Python's life of yeah, Brian. Yeah, of course. You know, follow the gourd. No, follow the shoe. Follow the, you know, it's <laughs> Well, who do we follow? Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think a good comic will turn it back and say to you, follow yourself. Yes. And do what you do. And that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So. Well, I'm not sure Chappelle doesn't do that, but we can I yeah. guess, agree to disagree on that. We can. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to get off your chest? You get a trivia contest. I do. Yeah. No, it, it's been fun. I you know, but uh, I have a lot I want to get off my chest. <laughs> what else you got? All the no, no. I I have all those war crimes. I got to confess. Oh, to, but, okay. Um, yeah, this is a safe space for that. Is it? Yeah, I don't think this can be admitted in court because no one's going to listen to me. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, Joe DeFeo's on that? No, no, no. Um, no, there's nothing else. I think this, uh, I, I got out what I wanted to say, and thank you for letting me come on your show. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yes, uh, this, this was hopefully a pillar for uh, people that disagree with each other to follow. Yeah. I think this is a pretty good conversation. What I do agree. you think? I, that was pretty good? Yeah, I disagree with you. I thought yeah. it was a terrible conversation. Yeah. I- <laughs> uh, and here's why. Uh, when I look to Nico as a guiding principle of what I think, yeah. I have to have someone to tell me what to think. Sure. <laughs> Which is why I subscribe to all his podcasts and give him five-star ratings. That's true. On Apple Podcasts. And Stitcher, podcasts? Sure, Spotify, yeah. everything. Spotify, wherever yeah. you find your podcast. Did you watch the Emmys? No. You didn't? No, I forgot they were on. I did have some Emmy takes that I should probably get off my chest. Let's hear them. Maybe I'll do it later. No, I just think it's preposterous that Game of Thrones won Best Trauma. Oh, yeah. I just think it's preposterous. Oh, yeah. I didn't need to see that. (laughs) I didn't need to see the Emmys to know that was ridiculous. (laughs) That was a a Return of the Kings thing to me. Yeah. Where they looked at the whole of it and they were like, well, we got to do something. So Game of Thrones was such a cultural phenomenon. They had to give it an Emmy at the end of its at the end of its run yeah not because it was the best season because it wasn't no but because it was the best show because it was such a cultural phenomenon they had to do it right well these shows often feel grandfathered in to the emmys too uh i i had this idea i think what should happen is once you win best drama or best comedy once you're disqualified for the next year the one category no one i'm such an awards nerd i'm the only one that knows this but my favorite emmys comedy or my favorite emmys category is always best original theme song it's okay. like given out at the Creative Arts Emmys, and yeah. I you go back the history of that award, and every year they get it right. And what I realized, the reason why they get it right is because you're only eligible your first year on the air. Oh, really? Yes. So, okay. like, if you have a great theme song, season two, if you keep the same theme song, theoretically you should win the award again. Right. So their way of countering that is to just say you get it one year, and then you're done. Oh, that's smart. So you go back, and it's like, wow, such a like diverse, awesome list of winners. Succession won this year, and it's right. got like by far and away the best theme song on TV. I understand that you are desperate to talk about Succession. Oh, my God, dude. <laughs> you would love Succession. That is on my list. It was on my list before The Righteous Gemstones came out. Yeah. After Chernobyl, yeah. Before Righteous Gemstones, <laughs> smack in between. But then I got caught up in the Righteous Gemstones because I love Danny McBride, I love John Goodman, as do I. Yeah. So this is sort of the third. part. I love Eastbound and Down. Yeah, it's One the of my third part comedies. of that. I guess he's considering it a trilogy. Yeah, Eastbound and Down, the Vice Principles, Vice Principles, and then this yeah. is his Damaged Man trilogy. <laughs> yeah. But yes, oh yeah, I did not know that about the theme songs. That's actually pretty smart. Right. Um, I always, because Game of Thrones, it feels like, has won for the last five years, which I think it has. Well, Julia Louis Dreyfus has won Best Actress in a She was upset, her. though. She was. That Phoebe was, Waller yeah. Bridge won. Yep. For a very, have you ever seen Fleabag? I have not. Very good show. Uh, I ended up watching um, The Boys, uh-huh. which was good. Oh, yeah, I've heard good things. Um, I ended up watching, oh, the Julia Roberts one, Homecoming. Uh yeah, Sam Esmail directed yeah, yeah. pretty good. good yeah good. I watched it the the guy from Boardwalk Empire Joe Maganello no Shea Wiggum yes Shea Wiggum's great on that show he's my favorite performance on that I show. know but all I can think of now is Chief Wiggum oh. <laughs> um but yeah no that was that was a really good show yeah um Succession is so right up I'll your alley I'll, it's I will, crazy I promise you I will binge it and then I'll come back as, and as, we'll talk about it yes as someone that often has some very opinionated uh, opinions. Uh, thoughts opinions <laughs> was often very opinionated on like the Murdoch family and other oh yeah yeah this is a satire of the Murdoch family okay but it is also one of the great it's simultaneously the best sitcom and the best drama on TV at the same time hmm. it's incredible it's so good and the characters are both despicable but also very likable that's it's it's the same thing with the righteous gemstones yeah they are there's not a likable character in a lot yeah and yet you can't stop watching it of course because you care about what happens to them which is another thing you guys talked about a while back was the golden age of television yep i think we're in the golden age of content yeah i think we're still we're, we're carried over from the golden age of television yeah i think it's sort of with the sopranos and breaking bad i think there's so much out there that's good we just have to be so selective about it yes and you feel like there's like you can't keep up. Yeah. There's this show that just debuted on Netflix called Unbelievable. 
Oh, that was so good. You watched it. I binged that whole thing. See, I want to watch it so bad, but I'm like, man, I got five other shows. I'm watching the last season of Mad Men. I'm finally yeah. wrapping up Mad Men, and I'm doing... Uh, I, I just started Chernobyl as well, and I just finished Fleabag, and it's just like... It's too much. I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about Chernobyl. Uh, I thought the first episode was just horrifying. It really is. It's just the most... It's the best horror movie of the year. It really is. It's incredible. Is that the, is that the episode that ends with them... How does it end? I'm trying to remember. Well, the 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 last phone call is when they make the phone call to yeah. um, Lane Price from yeah. Mad Men. Um, there's a there's a um, companion podcast. Yeah. Um, the guy who wrote and wrote it and created it. Yeah. Is on with Peter Sagal. Oh, really? And it's fascinating because they go into some behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Um, and they do some translations of the Russian that actually they don't do on the show. For and they go into why people don't have Russian accents on the show, which right. I'm so happy. I noticed that first thing. And I said, thank God these people are not talking like Boris and Natasha because that would have taken me completely <laughs> Yeah, out. I'm totally fine with that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's like uh, The the Death of Stalin. Do you see that movie? I No, it's on my list. I want to see it though. You'd love that as yeah, well, yeah. but that's they just kept all their accents. Buscemi yeah. just speaks like Buscemi. And the idea was they didn't want that to distract from the improv. Right. Well, they wanted also, to make, be able to play in the space while also just... Right. Talking also, those one. people don't speak like that. Like, right. You know? So, yes, I uh, Chernobyl is really good. Um, but yes, I I think you're right. I think the Emmy should probably shift around, and it would it would make sense because then the Emmy nominations would have to actually think about what made a good show that season. Right. And the shows would have to strive to live up to that. Yep. So yeah, I guess no. I theoretically, yes, the Emmy should exist. Where if you had a bad season, you would lose the award. Right. But with Game of Thrones, that just didn't happen for yeah. two straight. Se- there were two bad seasons that were still given. Well, best but they had they had to do it. I think because it was that cultural phenomenon to maintain relevancy. Yeah. Right. As much as they say they're not popularity contests, they are. All of award shows are. Of course. Um, but the creative the creative awards are probably my favorite. Yeah. As are you probably yours? Yes. And it started when I was in, I was twelve. Yep. One of my favorite movies of all time is Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Of course. And that won so many creative Emmys and a special Emmy. Uh, and Oscars. Oscars. Yep. And a special Oscar for the animator who just passed away, Richard Williams. Uh-huh. And they were all at the creative Emmys, which you never got to see. Right. So when they were like, oh, Academy Award winning movie. I was like, what? I watched the award show. I didn't see anything. <laughs> so, but that's what got me into that. I mean, I was a 10-year-old kid reading Premiere Magazine. <laughs> Wow, that's a throwback. Yeah. I wish I was alive to read Premiere Magazine. It was, it was a rag. Yeah. It was, <laughs> the only reason I read it was to keep up with the uh, box office, and um, it had some inside baseball kind of stuff, Yeah, but it was mostly just... It was like Entertainment Weekly. Of course. But with more money. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, you know, I remember I used to have... I was the only kid who in my locker in middle school had cutouts from Premiere Magazine. And like I had cutouts of EW. Oh, I'm not really? kid- oh yeah, dude. Yeah. I had e- I got EW since I was like eight. But you're right. That was just all puff pieces. Yeah. I just went there to see. You're right. Wow. It's very it's box office and TV ratings. Yeah. I just flipped to the end and I just yeah. and then it would do like the what to watch this week. Yeah. Just so you knew what was debuting. You, you were probably as an eight year old. you like, man, that Owen Gleiberman's full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but yeah. No. I would I would read Premiere. I had a subscription. <laughs> I don't know how I got it, but I got it in high school and I kept it through college. I had a subscription to Vanity Fair. <laughs> Word. So, yeah. <laughs> Not bad. But, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think that's probably a good way of making the Emmys more interesting, for sure. Yeah. Um, also, like, the Comedy Awards, uh, Fleabag, that was a nice surprise. Um, I'm happy that they just didn't give it to Veep for, like... Although I love Veep. It's just yeah. for eight seasons in a row. We, we get it. Um, and, yeah, Chernobyl won Best miniseries i, I believe best and best director yeah i think all yeah. that all that stuff uh those are my emmy thoughts i think they're very irrelevant and they don't <laughs> 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 and that's i have a hard time talking about them just because the like, oscars at least feel like an event when they happen and the emmys as you just said you forgot they were on you I would did. never forget the oscars were do you on. know why i forgot they were on yeah i, I would why? forget the oscars were on too because they're not stream they're they're not on streaming yeah they're not streaming anymore right um or if they are there's not a big build up to them. And most of the stuff I don't see ads for the Emmys on the streaming shows I watch. Right. So so much of the stuff I watch is now streaming. Right. So Yeah, you're never you're not watching Fox the network anymore. Right. Yeah. I'll uh, be watching it on Disney Plus. Yeah, new episodes of Bob's Burgers. Uh <laughs> All right, that's it. Joe DeFeo, thank you. Thank you. Uh this has been Cultured. We'll be back next week. 
So come back. You won't be here, though. I won't. One of these days. We'll if you ever back. want to sound off on anything, just let me know. I'll let you know. All right. Should I do the theme song? Yeah, go ahead. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys.